morning from Germany. Good afternoon to Kyrgyzstan and welcome to the audience wherever you are. My name is Isabel Habrecht and I am the head of the Northeast and Central Asia Division at Hans Seidel Foundation in Munich. Before we start, I have some uh, very important technical information for you. Um, we have a simultaneous translation today for you, so you can listen to the seminar in English as we will be speaking English, but you can also listen to it in Russian. It is very important that you choose the language that you want to listen to at the bottom of your screen. You will find a little virtual button that you can click where you can choose which language you are listening to. Also at the low end of your screen, you can see a Q&A box. Here you can ask any question concerning Kyrgyzstan during the pandemic and we will try our best to answer all of your questions today within the next hour. If you encounter technical issues, you can also use the chat function and get in touch with our organization team behind the scenes. They will be happy to assist you with any troubleshooting. And finally, we will be recording this seminar and we will very likely put it on our website later on. So you are listening to our Talking Asia Politics series, which we organize together with the South and Southeast Asia Division um, in the Department for International Cooperation. Under the heading Talking Asia Politics, we discuss political and social developments in Asia, we point out risks and opportunities for the countries and consider the consequences for Europe. In our analysis, we always consider opinions from within the region as well as abroad, and we focus on a constructive dialogue, allowing different points of view to coexist. In 2020, the coronavirus spread rapidly around our very interconnected world, and quickly almost every country reported cases. However, although the virus caused the same disease in each country, there were vast differences in how each country reacted, in which countermeasures were taken, in how the virus spread through society and very likely also in the long and term consequences. So therefore, we have decided to take an in-depth look at the situation of eight different countries in Asia. We have asked experts who have followed the spread and the consequences of COVID-19 to analyze success and failure of different strategy and to point out potential short, medium and long-term consequences of the virus in the region. Finally, we will also have one expert on EU-Asia relations who will point out consequences for our future and our cooperations in and with Asia. The results of this analysis is our serious Asia fighting COVID-19. And after today, we have three more online seminars in the next month where our authors present their insights and each paper will be available for download. In the second half of this year, we will have a special publication where all nine contributions will be combined. So today we will take a closer look at Kyrgyzstan and I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker to you. Dr. Sherbeck is co-founder and director at Crossroads Central Asia, a Bishkek-based research institute. He is also a Volkswagen postdoctoral fellow based at the OSCE Academy in Bishkek. Dr. Sherbeck has previously served as deputy director of the OSCE Academy and dean of the of academic, ac ac academic um, development at the American University of Central Asia. He has taught international relations, foreign policy analysis, Central Asian politics, as well as Central Asia and Russia relations. And his research interests include domestic politics, international relations and foreign policy making in Central Asia. In addition to academic research, he regularly provides analysis and consulting to various international organizations in Kyrgyzstan. Dr. Sherbeck has followed the spread of COVID-19 in his country very closely, and I'm looking forward to hearing his assessment of the consequences uh, for Kyrgyzstan. With this, I would like to hand over to you, Dr. Sherbeck. Please tell us which challenges poses COVID-19 to Kyrgyzstan and what are the mid and long-term consequences according to your assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, for a very kind introduction and a good evening, good morning to everyone. Uh, depending on where you are. It is my great pleasure to be here and to be speaking about uh, the results of this study on the Kyrgyzstan's fight against the pandemic. I hope that everyone is in good health and shape. This is very relevant, particularly to Kyrgyzstan, where we are experiencing these days uh, a quite dramatic surge in the new cases uh, of coronavirus. The discussion today 
mainly focuses on the first year of the pandemic. Uh, basically, the study was completed uh, in March 2021, just a couple of months ago. So, which means that it necessarily does not include the developments after the end of March. And those changes have been quite dramatic, as we will uh, briefly touch later on. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Harbach mentioned, it is part of the series of the discussion. So uh, what I present is the in-depth study of the Kyrgyz experience. And I hope that uh, later the observers, academics will be able to cross and compare other cases uh, of the series and see what were the patterns, uh, general patterns, trends, similarities or differences across the countries. Uh, there are three questions that were central to the study, uh, which I will uh, uh, probably easiest would be to present in the slide. Let me share the screen. The first question was, the, what was the Kyrgyzstan's response to the uh, global crisis of the pandemic? So, First, we would like to outline the ex or exhaust the tactics, strategies, policies that Kyrgyzstan, and particularly the Kyrgyz government, adopted to address this uh, novel crisis in, in the form of novel coronavirus. Second, uh, going beyond describing what has happened, we would also like to assess what worked well and what particularly didn't work well in the Kyrgyz case to better understand the roots of the challenge that we face in Kyrgyzstan. And finally, what are the long-term, mid-term plus long-term consequences of the pandemic uh, for the future of the country? Of course, we have to acknowledge that uh, the, an, analyzing the pandemic is still uh, a challenging task. The developments are going on. Uh, in the, some countries are having kind of quite optimistic overview right now. Other countries do not really have uh, a good idea of what, which stage of the pandemic we are in. So in Kyrgyz case, particularly this uh, latest couple of weeks have uh, shown a dramatic increase in the new cases. So uh, very much comparable to the disastrous so-called Black July that we had last year when the hospitals literally ran out of beds. So uh, it is quite challenging to really claim what if we know actual long-term consequences, we may not know it. So whatever I say reflects on what we could have uh, found as a result of the first year of the pandemic uh, in Kyrgyzstan. But before we address these questions, I would like to briefly uh, kind of digress from the COVID topic. Uh, the report was provided or prepared with two distinct audiences in mind. The first group was those who interested in Kyrgyzstan and particularly on how the pandemic developed in this country. The second group was uh, the people looking at the pandemic in a comparative scale. So looking at how different countries addressed the pandemic. And the second group of people, of course, would know much less about Kyrgyzstan compared to those who are in Kyrgyzstan or those who have been following Kyrgyzstan. For that, for that reason, uh, some of what I say will be more or less basic or familiar for Kyrgyz people or people in Kyrgyzstan. And, but necessarily, I think it is important for us to kind of contextualize what kind of country Kyrgyzstan is so that uh, we better understand the context. Uh, but before that, uh, very briefly, what sort of uh, situation we have uh, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan in terms of the pandemic. Here we have One second, uh, I think uh, I have to open a different file because this one doesn't include apparently some of the slides that must have been there. 
this new technologies are quite challenging at times. Well, anyway, let's uh, move on. Uh, there were several slides just to demonstrate uh, the Kyrgyzstan, uh, some basic facts. But nevertheless, for those who follow the broader picture and uh, do not know Kyrgyzstan very well, I have to just uh, provide a couple of observations. First, the Kyrgyzstan is a small central region state, of course, and bordering with China and formerly part of the Soviet uh, Union. This is important for us to understand the kind of state, the kind of state institutions that uh, this country has that have been uh, tasked to address uh, the pandemic crisis. Kyrgyzstan's economy is very weak. It is not only small, but weak, heavily dependent on remittances from uh, labor migrants, mostly in Russia, uh, and export of gold, and also dependent on loans and the grants from outside the country. Politically, Kyrgyzstan is, I think, quite well known as uh, a regime fluctuating between a weak democracy and weak authoritarian regime. It has been called an island of democracy in Central Asia in the past decades, particularly late middle, middle, middle of 90s. The elections are conducted more or less regularly. However, never in Kyrgyzstan opposition came to power through elections. We had three instances of uh, regime transition, and all of them happened after the uh, street protests, the latest being October 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. The country suffers from a high level of corruption, particularly in the high government offices. This is a well-known problem, uh, and every new president of Kyrgyzstan starts his uh, business acknowledging this is a problem. However, we have seen uh, little progress in this. These are, of course, very gross simplifications, but I think it is good to understand how Kyrgyzstan as a country, with its political history, with its geography and economy, is very different from other countries, particularly in this series, some including China or South Korea or Mongolia. These are very, very distinct countries, although uh, we are all in part of the bigger uh, region of Asia. The COVID-19, the pandemic, came to Kyrgyzstan relatively late, but it has hit quite hardly. On the one hand, of course, it is. we have to acknowledge that it is quite challenging and maybe not even an accurate task for us to try to compare whether Kyrgyzstan was struck harder or not that hard. It is difficult to compare countries uh, for a variety of reasons. But to give a picture, these are the statistics of the COVID-19 as of today. Uh, it is, of course, hard to make sense unless you know the Kyrgyzstan's population, which is about six and a half million and so on. But to provide greater context, we could uh, compare this to the deaths of the, out of the COVID uh, pandemic to total excess deaths. Uh, the, the excess deaths is a notion uh, that relates to that helps us to understand the true scale of the damage that we see after, uh, because of the COVID-19. In blue, the figures are the official recorded figures of deaths from COVID. And in red, uh, we have the figures for excess deaths. Excess deaths for 2020 is basically uh, the number of deaths that is occurred on top of the average number of deaths we would normally have. So in Kyrgyzstan's case, compared to the average number of deaths for past five years, we had extra 8,400 deaths, out of which only 1,400 are accounted for COVID. And we, there, we don't have proper explanation for the remaining 7,000 deaths. And of course, uh, this figure 
can help us to understand the true scale of the culture damage. And it also demonstrates that uh, since we didn't have other major disasters like earthquakes or other problems that would cause major um, spike in deaths, we can claim that directly or indirectly the COVID, the pandemic is accountable for the remaining deaths as well. Some of them could be COVID cases that were not qualified or not defined as COVID, and others could be deaths from other uh, reasons, but uh, caused by COVID in a sense that the people, patients could not properly receive advice or medical help uh, with hospitals being overpacked and uh, without any beds and so on. The disc disc discrepancy between the excess deaths and the reported COVID deaths is quite important. And uh, th this chart comes from The Economist, which demonstrates that how large discrepancy is. Uh, the colored part are the deaths accounted for COVID formally, officially, and the line is uh, the monthly fluctuation of the excess deaths. You see that in all three countries of this region, uh, excess deaths really doesn't uh, come overlap or doesn't overlap with the COVID reports. Compare this to a couple of several European countries where excess deaths, as it grows up and as it goes down, has been very much uh, going together with the reported COVID casualties, uh, which, which kind of gives us a warning that we cannot really have reliable data uh, to assess the real scope of the problem. And finally, this economic impact. The, another damage of the COVID was the shrinking contraction of the economy. So in Kyrgyzstan, we have the steepest decline, nearly 8% of the negative growth of the economy for 2020. And just for the comparison, the figures for other countries of the region have been uh, quite different. I will stop slides here and just move uh, with uh, my face directly facing you. I, I hope that uh, we can establish more or less kind of eye contact. I'll be looking at the camera more now. Now, uh, these uh, the figures that I demonstrated basically show that Kyrgyzstan has been hit hard, just like many other countries. But now the question for us is, uh, what was the government of Kyrgyzstan's biggest challenge as we faced the crisis? And here I would like to, of course, acknowledge that the COVID-19 and the pandemic has been a kind of all-embracing problem, uh, stressing every single policy area uh, from education to healthcare to taxation to international relations. But there are three problems that we could focus on for now. First, the government had a challenge of containing the spread of the virus. So the first problem that the government had was how to minimize the spread of the coronavirus among the population. Second, providing medical support for those who already contracted infection. That basically uh, treating the patients. And the third, the task was alleviating economic damage, uh, which was a result of the lockdown and other uh, pandemic measures. Containment was, of course, the first in the chronologically, as soon as the news from China came about the new virus and the country started uh, kind of lockdown processes. Kyrgyzstan was not an exception. Uh, the initial efforts included uh, travel suspension from China. Uh, although we have to also acknowledge that despite bordering with China, Kyrgyzstan was uh, quite lucky in terms of receiving the first cases of coronavirus quite late. Only on 18th of March, as far as I remember, we, we had registered the first cases of coronavirus. And those were, of course, not coming from China, but uh, from Saudi Arabia, the people who went to pilgrimage to the, and they were returning so they were the first patients with registered coronavirus. Uh, 
as soon as the two cases emerged, the government dramatically stepped up the containment measures. And by end of March, Kyrgyzstan went into a very strict version of lockdown with schools moving to first moving to unplanned spring breaks, longer spring breaks, and later switching to online mode uh, throughout the country. The businesses were shut down, particularly in Bishkek, the biggest city, uh, the center, business center of the country was severely uh, faced very severe version of lockdown with everyone ordered staying at home. And the emergency situation was declared with the police and even military given the emergency powers. However, in the Kyrgyz case with the relatively weak economy, we could not afford too long period of the uh, lockdown. So in May in, and early June, the lockdown measures were released, uh, relaxed and almost completely lifted uh, towards the summer, which then led to a huge spike of the new cases uh, which we'll cover, which we saw, I think, in the uh, charts. So we had so-called Black July, where just exactly a year ago from now, uh, in Bishkek, the hospitals ran out of capacity. Uh, people with video footage and photos demonstrating how people were a little dying, unable to enter the building of the hospitals. So the containment measures was that, and it basically lasted for several weeks in the spring. Second problem, of course, the treating patients. As we receive growing number of patients already with uh, confirmed uh, coronavirus, what do we do? As the, there was nothing, of course, here novel to in invent from the Kyrgyz government. The non no country in the world had and still has effective drugs against the coronavirus. And of course, we didn't have vaccine back then. So the only thing we could do, the government could do is to accept the hospitalized people with uh, severe symptoms of the coronavirus and uh, help with alleviating the symptoms. The task proved to be very difficult for Kyrgyzstan's government uh, as uh, hospitals are out of beds and the workforce. Several daytime infusion sites were opened throughout Bishkek uh, just to, for patients to arrive during the day receive some injections and some advice from doctors and go home again. Finally, the economic damage. Uh, that was the biggest problem. The government, what government did was declare that taxes would be suspended uh, or deferred. Later, the government set up the anti-crisis fund to provide uh, concessional lending to local businesses. But of course, there was nothing comparable to measures we see uh, in more developed countries where households and local businesses received one time or two time uh, payments from the government to support or to compensate the losses incurred because of the lockdown. Kyrgyzstan, having literally empty budget, could not afford providing help of that sort. So the only thing we could do is pay taxes later or receive concessional loans. There were, of course, uh, these policy measures revealed big issues in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, nearly none of them worked very well. And uh, I already mentioned the shortage of beds. What, that was the biggest problem. The public healthcare system uh, was stressed and brought to its limits in many ways, not only in terms of beds or buildings, but also in terms of the workforce. Uh, in the study of the Kyrgyzstan's case, I consulted with several doctors who directly worked in uh, so-called red zones, uh, the parts of the hospital directly treating the COVID patients. And they were telling stories that the equipment, medications were lacking, but more also several hospitals were packed by doctors whose specialization was very different. Uh, which resulted in the fact that application of med medical protocols was not consistent across different hospitals or clinics. 
or so-called observation sites uh, with uh, surgeries, surgery, uh, surgeons or orthopedicians, different doctors all involved in uh, providing treatment for COVID. That was kind of revealed the failure of the government to prepare in advance during the lockdown period to prepare the sufficient number of trained medical force and buildings of the new hospitals. Only in July, the government announced construction of new hospitals in Bishkek and second largest city, Osh. But that was a measure too little and too late, uh, only after the period when the, uh, when the surge of July started slowing down. There are two other issues with the society. All of the uh, previous topics were about the government and government measures. But we should also acknowledge that a big problem was the way how the society responded to the new crisis. On the one hand, and bad news, was that uh, in Kyrgyzstan, just like in many other countries, there was a huge degree of uh, distrust or denial of COVID people simply dismissing the importance of the subject, importance of the illness. Uh, plus, and probably even more important, was the prominence of disregard for COVID in the society. Uh, although the, the government lacked resources to enforce very strict lockdown, so it had to release, uh, relax the measures, the people, uh, the People basically went free with uh, daily communication with, uh, with uh, kind of phenomenon called toys in Kyrgyzstan, with family celebrations, family gatherings, reunions, and uh, with government having little resource to enforce the social distancing and uh, other restrictive measures. The societal uh, processes, I think, uh, led to dramatic growth of infections in those summer months. At the same time, as the government faced this emergency, it was the society, particularly volunteers and civil society, that came as a rescue force uh, to help the government, to help the public health care system to face this problem. So as governments run out of money, run out of resources, the fundraising and uh, to support to, uh, to provide the food package to the most vulnerable people, to buy equipment or to buy uh, medications for hospitals were all organized very much by civil society activists in Kyrgyzstan. At, at the later stage when uh, we had the so-called Black July, the most toughest period of the pandemic, the volunteers, uh, young students or recent graduates of medical institutions went to provide logistical support to doctors in observation sites. So it was very impressive demonstration of the societal solidarity in the time of emergency. Uh, some demonstrate, some argue that this kind of phenomenon reflects the state's failure to provide basic services. So when there is no public institution, then it is up, up to the society to compensate and to deliver the service. Uh, some argue that this is more of a cultural, historical uh, phenomenon, with Kyrgyz people uh, mostly living in the nomadic societies without state institution for most of the past centuries. Uh, there is this culture of mutual help during the emergencies. Uh, whatever is that, it, uh, we have to acknowledge that the community response was uh, critically important for overcoming the the most difficult period of the pandemic. Now, so in economic aspects, in medical aspects, and in terms of the containing the spread of the virus, so the governments took some measures, mostly half-hearted and half-successful, mostly failing. And uh, this gives us an opportunity to think kind of more broadly uh, and to think what were the conditions that enabled such not so good results in Kyrgyzstan and what are the implications for the longer term. 
here I would like to focus on three areas possibly. First is the state of economy. The Kyrgyzstan being a weak economy, not only as an economy as a whole, but also weak, uh, very small fiscal space of the government when the government has, doesn't have much money to in its disposal to support. That was very hugely important. The economy contracted as a result of the pandemic with poverty levels going up from 20% to 31% according to the World Bank. So 10% of the population shifted from non-poor people to poor category into the poverty. Of course, the causes were lying in the existential dependence of Kyrgyzstan on several sources of the support for the economy. One is the trade and travel. The pandemic disrupted travel, disrupted trade. And Kyrgyzstan being heavily import-oriented or import-dependent country uh, was one of the early and biggest victims of this suspension of uh, trade. Second, the shutdown of local businesses was very hurting. And this is probably hardly comparable to the similar shutdowns in developed economies. In Kyrgyzstan, particularly in Bishkek, a huge chunks of economy is run by people on a daily wage. Those who use, consume money that they earn on that day, uh, from people working in bazaars, in markets, taxi drivers, and so on. So since the lockdown meant for a couple of months meant they had to stay at home uh, with literally no savings, uh, that process, that kind of uh, event exposed the pre-existing problem, pre-COVID problem of Kyrgyzstan, kind of depend the lack of a uh, very healthy functioning economy. Finally, the remittances. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is routinely among the top three or top five countries in the world in terms of the dependence of the economy on remittances that is money transfers from outside the country. As pandemic hit other countries, including Russia and Kazakhstan, the primary sources of uh, remittance for Kyrgyzstan, initial periods of the pandemic meant that households stopped receiving the same amount of money from their family members working in Russia and in Kazakhstan, which of course contributed to shift from uh, mid, uh, kind of shift from uh, non-poor state to poverty into poverty of many households in particular rural areas of Kyrgyzstan. At the broader level, this dependence demonstrated the deg degree of fragility of the Kyrgyz economy, and dependence on uh, outside sources of money of capital, plus, it exposed the precariousness of the vulnerable groups. Uh, the pandemic demonstrated how youth or women ended up being among the categories most affected by the lockdown measures and by other economic implications of the uh, pandemic. There are several uh, studies already conducted in Kyrgyzstan, which demonstrate that even the particular industries that were hit heavily were the ones employing mostly women, mostly uneducated, kind of unqualified, poorly qualified workforce, already vulnerable groups, and they were hit hardest. Politically, the pandemic year was very eventful. Uh, we had, I, I tried to calculate the number of foreign, uh, number of healthcare ministers. So for the first year of the pandemic, we had, Kyrgyzstan had three health ministers kind of replaced each other, four prime ministers, three deputy prime ministers overseeing the pandemic struggle and two presidents. That is, uh, the two presidents is about the regime turnover in October when President Jane Becker was overthrown uh, as a result of street protests. But other the change of ministers was also a result of the instability within the government, uh, which to great extent reflected the lowering trust of the public on the state and on how the state was uh, 
uh, addressing the problem, addressing the crisis. Indeed, the, if we think of the reasons how October Revolution, so-called October Revolution happened, uh, of course, there were other problems like corruption and the political mobilization of opposition and so on. Uh, it is undeniable fact that the sitting government's failure to convince the public that it did its job well in terms of fighting pandemic contributed very much. Uh, first, of course, the economic implications of the pandemic didn't make the government very popular. Second, there were numerous reports of corruption and embezzlement of the COVID-related resources by officials, by high-level officials. And uh, as far as I remember, one of the former healthcare ministers and uh, one of the former prime ministers are arrested and detained now precisely on charge related to use of uh, distribution of the pandemic-related resources. So uh, in terms of the politics, we could summarize that the pandemic kind of exposed the low level of trust of the public in the state institutions. And uh, the new government that we have since October will have huge headache in terms of how to fix or how to rebuild that public uh, trust. Finally, in terms of international relations, uh, one would think that foreign policy or IR isn't really directly related to coronavirus or the pandemic. However, in case of Kyrgyzstan, I think a couple of points could be made in terms of the consequences of the COVID-19 on Kyrgyzstan's international relations. First, of course, the pandemic demonstrated the degree to which Kyrgyzstan is dependent externally. Uh, even before the first cases of COVID emerged in Kyrgyzstan, the government started actively seeking, actively fundraising uh, outside the country. Kyrgyzstan was among the first, I think it was even the first country to receive the IMF's uh, emergency aid to support the government measures to deal with the pandemic. Uh, other pleas were included, uh, requests for China and other governments to suspend the payment of the debts so that uh, we could focus on uh, domestic issues. Now, currently, the, in terms of vaccinations, Kyrgyzstan is already demonstrating the degree to which we are dependent on uh, outside help uh, without being able to procure vaccines ourselves. Uh, basically, the government is dependent, basically waiting for Russian, for Chinese uh, vaccines. Uh, most of them for free. Uh, we were not, the, the government wasn't able to not only procure the vaccine, but also to convince the population to uh, get vaccinated. As, as of now, Kyrgyzstan's vaccinated population includes, I think, 1.5% of the population, so very low. And second, of course, the pandemic did not, didn't only expose the dependence of Kyrgyzstan, but also exacerbated the dependence. Uh, if before the pandemic, Kyrgyzstan could be called as a kind of routinely kind of asking hand or beggar in terms of requesting for credits and grants at the global level. After the pandemic, it became clear that even within the regional scale, uh, at the, within the Central Asian context, Kyrgyzstan became acknowledged as the weakest link with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan uh, demonstrating that they are willing to provide humanitarian aid to Kyrgyzstan, construct how, uh, buildings of hospitals for us, provide medications and so on. So basically, if before the COVID, Kyrgyzstan within the Central Asia was uh, just one of other Central Asian states, as a result of the pandemic, I think uh, the image or reputation of Kyrgyzstan as weak and dependent and vulnerable got really established even at the regional level. To conclude, uh, to leave some time for questions, uh, we can say that indeed the pandemic proved to be a severe stress test for the whole entire state system in Kyrgyzstan. It revealed the fragility of the economy, 
And uh, other than that, poor policy decisions, corruption, uh, and low level of public trust in the state institutions contributed to different aspects of the challenge that society faced with the pandemic. At the same time, we do see the resilience of the society in terms of uh, how it reacted to the emergency situation. And as the new government is trying to fix the problems or trying to find new approach, uh, several things, kind of three points could be highlighted as the priorities for it. First, uh, the government must do everything possible to restore the trust of the population in the public institutions and the state. People should start trusting the healthcare minister's statements or to doctors or to economy ministry. So uh, the whole impression that the state abandoned the population, abandoned local business must be somehow reverted so that uh, the government measures are implemented and enforced and the population supports the government. That was lost and that is going to be a very difficult task to address. Second, the new government should now completely understand very much that uh, the priority of resilience of the economy is huge. External dependence, poor fiscal space, large debt are the biggest problems. How the economy can become healthier, more diversified, less dependent on outside are the big questions. Uh, whether the local government now understands and uh, knows the ways to address this problem, I don't know, and I don't think it's evident, but that is a problem. And finally, in terms of IR, international relations, this government should finally understand that Kyrgyzstan should become less aid-seeking and a less enemy-seeking country, trying to play geopolitics, at the same time trying to uh, get some dividends from other countries, but rather become reliable, trustworthy, competent and proactive partner for our international allies. We realize that uh, the crisis like pandemic are never won uh, individually. It requires cooperation, partnership, and the Kyrgyz government has faces this huge task of convincing that the government can work with foreign partners and uh, be a reliable partner and not necessarily the one that is a burden on other countries' taxpayers. So these are you know, summary of the key chapters of this study. Uh, many parts are tentative, things are developing, so uh, we will have to update. Here I finish and if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to address them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherbeck, for this uh, really interesting and uh, very in-depth analysis. You've covered a whole range of topics from government politics to society, economics, and also international politics. So um, I will try to revisit some of them with some questions. And also I want to invite the audience to just pose any questions in the Q&A box. Um, what I found really interesting is your um, presentation with the excess deaths compared to the official number of um, COVID-19 deaths. Um, what do you think is the reason? Are there any political interests behind it to keep the official numbers low or is it just a lack of testing and diagnosis? Yeah, mic is off. Sorry. Yes, thank you very much. I asked this question to several doctors and uh, people working in the system, how to explain this discrepancy. And obviously there is no uh, single explanation uh, as to how to account for this phenomenon. Uh, apparently there are two or three main reasons. First, uh, as people die, the protocols, how to qualify deaths was not consistently applied. Uh, so very, we don't want to go too technical, but when a person dies, uh, the person may have COVID, but also very evident health problems with heart or with diabetes. So uh, doctors suggest that 
uh, there was just inconsistent application. And when you qualify the deaths, which leads to different uh, differences in these numbers. There was in the society, there were huge arguments. At some point, there was a belief that in the conspiracy theory that the government is inflating COVID casualties in order to attract greater aid from outside. Then there was another alternative conspiracy theory saying that government is hiding real number of uh, COVID in order not to sow the panic among the society. So, uh, and I literally, I, I cannot cite the person, but one of the doctors suggested that every time before the major political events, such as elections, uh, there was very deliberate lowering of the COVID figures uh, in the weeks prior to elections. And so we had elections in October, and another election in January. And apparently that suggests that the, there was a political manipulation as well to kind of try to manage the public expectations or public demands, public reactions. Uh, but this is indeed very impressive discrepancy, uh, which is not the case in, in the case of Europe, in case of uh, East Asian countries. Yeah, so clearly um, the mix of several factors yes. playing a role to which then leads to statistics that are not don't represent the reality very well. You also mentioned that uh, yeah, politically it was quite uh, some unstable times in Kyrgyzstan. You had a regime turnover, as the change of several ministers, and you have mentioned the dissatisfaction of the people with the government. So clearly, the idea that times of crisis benefit the incumbent government um, is not correct for Kyrgyzstan. But what do you think? What could or should the government have done better? Well. Probably that's too big question for us to not only answer, but even to have an idea what could have been done uh, differently. But uh, as we speak to different people, uh, one thing was of course that the biggest mistake uh, was the very strict lockdown in the early stage of pandemic. For many people suggest that the government uh, started too early uh, without proper preparation. Uh, which basically resulted in, the, in exhausting the public tolerance for lockdown. The daily figures were like two, three persons of new cases of COVID and everyone sitting at home. So it, it basically paid lip service. So people started distrusting the, the problem. So dismissing the COVID as a danger and suggesting that the government is just playing, doing something else while using the uh, coronavirus as a pretext. So that I think paid very bad service to the government because at the later stage, when crisis really came in big scale, the government didn't have uh, political resources to enforce similar measures again. But other than that, uh, the Kyrgyz government faces very similar set of problems in any policy area and that is called corruption. The government's inability to ensure the transparency and accountability uh, was the biggest reason why public simply disobeyed the government uh, regulations. And uh, it's been a very chronic problem. And uh, I think even though corruption doesn't directly explain the failures of the pandemic policies, it explains the degree to which the society a priori was not supportive of the government's measures. And why government eventually ended up being uh, losing sight, not the kind of convincing and the reliable partner or the protection for their citizens. Other than that, uh, it is uh, this economic poverty and the lack of resources that state had in its disposal. Of course, this is, would be unfair to say that that's a mistake of the government. That's the reality of uh, poor governments, poor states or poor societies. When the crisis like this hits, these countries get inevitably damaged in a bigger scale compared to the countries that had fiscal space to kind of alleviate the burden of the pandemic on the society. That was simply not available in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, 
uh, sort of combined with wrong policy decisions or kind of uh, too late to little decisions, I think this was probably the biggest kind of elephant in the room. That's uh, the lack of or deficit limitations of economic resources in disposal. Yeah. So now you have a new government. Um, do you think, are you optimistic? Do you think the new government will do a better job or are you pessimistic? And do you think maybe even the pandemic will threaten the democracy in Kyrgyzstan? What is your assessment? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Of course, the new government uh, has not really convinced the population that it is going to be a dramatical different from the previous government. Uh, it's still too early to say, but uh, I think the, our new healthcare minister made headlines internationally already, uh, claiming that, uh, that he knows how to treat coronavirus uh, by using the aconite route, kind of uh, very risk, a risky form of uh, traditional medicine, uh, which would have huge side effects. And it, uh, he was uh, condemned by the medical community, by civil society in Kyrgyzstan for uh, kind of discrediting medical system in general by, by claiming that he and his friend, the president, are preparing those uh, kind of liquid form of that aconite and uh, claiming that that really helps with COVID. That was a huge blow, uh, not contributing to rebuilding the trust of the public in the state again, of course. Uh, so I have very little uh, confidence that the new government is going to be any different in the way how it addresses the COVID. Moreover, the new government came on the wave of the populist uh, rhetoric, uh, very much addressed against the international kind of investors. So, uh, and very much in the, uh, in the, in the spirit of uh, populist nationalism, where the liberal values, liberal norms are easily discredited or dismissed as not belonging to Kyrgyz. So just this week, uh, the parliament adopted two new laws or bills, uh, one on uh, manipulation of information, basically, a bill that will result in uh, curtailing the freedom of expression in Kyrgyzstan. This bill initially was adopted last June or July at the heat of the pandemic uh, of the past year, but the president then uh, vetoed it. Now, the current president will most likely sign it, uh, judging by the way how the parliament was given green light to adopt. Uh, and another law was on introducing greater uh, inspections or requirements of reporting for non-governmental organizations, basically an attack against the civil society uh, in a very uh, naked form. So at the moment, uh, I don't see that the new government is going to be uh, very different in uh, not only struggling with the pandemic effects, but also more generally in terms of rebuilding the trust, the, the values and norms of democracy are being eroded further. And uh, yeah, so not much of positive change at the moment. Mm. Yes, so clearly the government hasn't lived up to expectations and might not do so in the future, but you mentioned that society really stepped up and there was a whole lot of community effort and volunteer work in order to fight the pandemic. Um, how did the volunteers organize themselves? I mean, did, did they use a certain platform or were they already organized as volunteers before it happened and then just stepped up? How did that happen all? The volunteer movements emerged primarily through social media. Uh, as the pandemic started, when initially reports came when the, because of the lockdown, different families were literally starving, uh, running out of savings and so on. Uh, in Facebook, in uh, WhatsApp, Telegram, the groups emerged saying that let's collect funds to support, uh, basically prepare food packages and distribute among the population. That was the initial phase. Uh, 
uh, of the process. And uh, as the hospitalizations went up in terms of numbers and the, the government really ran out of the resources, I think it, uh, as far as I remember, it was again, social media serving as a platform for mobilization of uh, these groups. How could we explain it? I think the roots really lie in the vibrant civil society that Kyrgyzstan has long had and really enjoyed having in the past several decades. Uh, if anyone checks or compares the this, uh, virtual social media, social networks, there's a huge, very huge difference between neighboring countries and Kyrgyzstan in terms of the level of activism or social activism among, among the population, including the younger generation. And this doesn't necessarily limit, is not limited to so-called NGOs or kind of Western funded uh, grant eating organizations as the government usually says. It, it has been really kind of a grassroots movement. I witnessed very different groups in Russian cities, kind of labor migrants in Moscow in Petersburg and other cities organizing among themselves to, gen, uh, to collect money and send to their hometowns to uh, those who were found really vulnerable. So this is probably a result of the early liberalization of Kyrgyzstan, a result of the uh, degree of civil society, plus uh, general knowledge in Kyrgyzstan that we don't expect too much from the government, from the state. So the weakness of the state has not been novelty for us. And uh, I think the population is relatively prepared to step in, in view that uh, expectations from the state are low. And if you compare to Europe or to other developed countries, basically it, it has been the state deciding what to do, how to do, providing the resources, but also in enforcing the measures. In Kyrgyzstan, neither resources, no enforcement. So that basically opens up the space for, or even, even requires uh, participation of the civil society and just activists in general. So those were, I think, were the main prerequisites for this phenomenon. Very interesting. Um, we have seen, we have uh, also looked at already at other Asian countries in previous online seminars and you've seen that in several other Asian countries, um, international relief organizations play a very big role now and they receive a lot of funding um, to, yeah, to deal with the consequences of COVID and the economical damage. Um, what role do international relief organizations play in Kyrgyzstan? At the moment, uh, it is really hard to come up with the very specific data, but uh, from the, as the pandemic started, Kyrgyzstan has become one of the countries really most actively seeking external help and really kind of embracing every organization willing to help. So uh, on the website of the healthcare minister, there's even the list of uh, all organizations and individuals who provided or granted masks, equipment, and uh, financial help. So on, in that sense, I think Kyrgyzstan is one of the countries that are indebted to international relief groups from, uh, from financial institutions like IMF, World Bank, AGP, to more specific organizations like ICRC or Red Cross, and foreign governments, foreign embassies. Uh, there were very few partners of Kyrgyzstan and development partners of Kyrgyzstan uh, who didn't get involved in uh, providing some form of uh, assistance. And uh, the only problem, of course, that the foreign governments themselves were under severe pressure. Uh, and so this was a situation unlike previous disasters in Kyrgyzstan. When, for example, I remember in 2010 when uh, there was a uh, huge interethnic violence in Kyrgyzstan. The government gathered huge kind of donor conference and the donors pledged literally kind of $1 billion or so of emergency help. This emergency, of course, was very different because United States, Europe or Russia, all governments were themselves under severe pressure and we couldn't expect uh, the same level of commitment and same uh, scale of help from outside. Nevertheless, 
we received as much as uh, we could probably mobilize. And uh, that was crucial to maintain the government's fiscal financial balance in the early stage when taxes, tax collection went down, businesses were shut down, salaries had to be paid, and everything was basically maintained thanks to the external aid. Okay, thank you. We are now already reaching at the end of today's seminar. Dr. Sherbeck's article will be available for download very soon. I can highly recommend it. It's an excellent analysis. And please also sign up for our following seminars. In two weeks, we will be looking at Thailand's fight against COVID-19. And also please feel free to stay in touch with us via our email address asia at hss.de. Via this address, you can also sign up to our newsletters in the South and Southeast Asia Division, as well as the Northeast and Central Asia Division, asia at hss.de. And with that, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sherbeck for his fantastic input today, our organization team behind the scenes, and last but not least, of course, everybody who signed up today. Thank you very much. When you sign out now, you. you will see a very short survey. So please fill it in and help us improve our future seminars. And with that, thank you. Goodbye.